Hi, I'm Thomas Henson with ThomasHenson.com, and today is another episode of Big Data, Big Questions. Today's question is all about the Kappa architecture and real-time analytics. So our question today came in from a user, and it's going to be about how we can tackle the Kappa architecture, and is it a good fit for those real-time analytics, for sensor networks, how it all kind of works together. Find out more right after this. So today's question came in from Francisco, and it's Francisco from Chile. And he says, best regards from Chile. So Francisco, thanks for your question and thanks for watching. So his question is, hi, I'm building a system for processing sensor network data in near real time. All this time, I've been studying the Lambda architecture in order to achieve this, but now I've ran into the Kappa architecture and I'm having trouble deciding between which one. He says, what he wants to do is he wants to analyze this near real time data in real time. So as the data is coming from the sensors, he wants to obtain knowledge and then push those out in some kind of uh, UI. So, you know, some kind of charts and graphs. And he's saying, do we have any suggestions about why we would choose one of these architectures that we would recommend for him? Well, thanks again, Francisco, for your question. And so, yes, I have some thoughts about how we should set up that network. So, but let's review real quick about what we've talked about in the previous videos of the Lambda architecture and what the Kappa architecture is and then how we're gonna implement those. So if you remember the Lambda architecture, we have two different streams. And so we have a batch level stream and we have a real time. So as your data comes in, it might come in through something that's a queuing system called Kafka, or it's in a area right there where we're just using it to queue all the data as it comes in. And so for that real time, you will follow that real time stream. And so you might use Spark or Flink or some kind of real time processing engine that's going to do the analytics and push that out to some of your dashboards for data that's just as it's coming in, right? So as soon as that data comes in, you want to analyze it as quick as you can. It's what we call near real time, right? But you also have your batch layer. So for your batch processing, for your storing of the data, right? Because at some point, you know, your queuing system, whether it's Kafka or something, it's going to get very, very large. And some of that data is going to be old and you don't need to have it in an area where you can stream it out and, and analyze it all the time. So you want it to be able to tier or you want to move that data off to maybe HDFS or S3 object. And so from there, you can, you know, use your distributed search. You can have it in HDFS, use Cassandra or some other kind of, you know, maybe it's HBase or some kind of NoSQL database that's working on top of Hadoop. And then you also can run your um, batch jobs there. So you can run your MapReduce jobs there, whether, you know, whether it's traditional MapReduce or whether it's, you know, Spark's uh, batch level processing. But you have two layers. And so that's one of the challenges with the Lambda architecture is you have these two different layers, right? So you're supporting two levels of code. And, you know, for a lot of your processing, a lot of your data that's coming in, maybe you're just using the real time there. But, you know, maybe the batch processing is used every month, but you're still having to support those two, diff two different levels of code. And so... Next, that's why we talk about the Kappa architecture, right? So the Kappa architecture, it simplifies it. So as your data comes in, you want to have your data that's in one queuing system or one storage device where your data comes in, you can do your analytics on it. So you can do your real-time processing and push that data out to your dashboards, your web applications, or however you're trying to consume that data. Then also do your distributed search as well. So you can, you know, if, you, if you're using Elasticsearch or some other kind of distributed search, maybe it's Solar or some of the other ones, you can be able to analyze that data and have it supporting that real-time search as well. But you might use Spark you know, and Flink for your real-time analytics, but you also wanted to do your batch too. So you're gonna have some batch processing that's gonna be done. But instead of creating a whole nother tier, you wanna be able to do that within that queuing system that you have. And so you know, whether you're using Kafka or whether you're using Pravega, which is a new open source product that just was released by Dell, you want to be able to have all that data in one spot so that when you're queuing that data, you know that it's going to be there, but you can also do your analytics on it. So you can, you know, use it for your distributed search. You can use it for those uh, streaming analytics jobs, but also whenever you go back to do some of your batch or some of your transitional processing, you know that, it, that, that it's in that same location too. That way there's redund there's not as much redundancy, right? So you're not having to store data in multiple locations and it's taking up more room than you really need. And so this is what we call the cap architecture. And this is what, why it's so popular right now is it simplifies that work stream. And so when we start deciding between those two, back to Francisco's question, Francisco, your application, it seems like it has a real need for real time, right? So there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of things that are going on there from the network and a lot of traffic that's coming in. And so this is gonna be where we break down a couple different concepts. And so we talked about 
bound and unbound. So a bound data set is data that we know how much data is going to come in, right? Or we wait to do and do the processing on that data after it's already came in. And so when you think of bound data, think of sales orders, think of, you know, end of year numbers. And so we know, you know, that's largely what we would consider transactional data. So we know all that we know all the data as it's coming in and then we're running the calculation then. But what your data is, is unbound. And so when we talk about unbound data is you don't know how much data is coming in, right? It's and it's infinitive. It's not going to end. So with network traffic, you don't know how long that's going to be going on. So the network traffic is going to continue to come in. You don't know, you know, you might you might get one terabyte at one point. You might get 10 terabytes. You know, it might you might scale up all, you know, all, all in one second. And then as the data comes in, it might come in uneven, right? So you might have some that's time time stamped a little bit earlier than other data that's coming in too. And so that's what we call unbound data. And so for unbound data, the CAP architecture works really well. It also works really well for bound data too. So when we start to look at that and looking at your project, my recommendation is to use the CAP architecture. Go ahead and use it because you're using real-time data, but then for those batch levels, and I'm, I'm sure that you'll start having some processing and some pieces that you start doing that are batch. You can also consume that in the CAP architecture as well. And so there's some things you can look into. So, you know, you can choose streaming analytics with, uh, you know, Spark, Spark Streaming. You can look at Flink, Beam. Those are some of the applications you can use, but you can also use distributed search. So you can use Solar, you can use Elasticsearch. All those are going to work well, whether you choose the CAP architecture or whether you choose the Lambda architecture. My recommendation is go with the CAP architecture. Well, thanks, guys. That's another episode of Big Data, Big Questions. Make sure you subscribe so that you never miss an episode. If you have any questions, have your question answered on, on Big Data, Big Questions. Just go to the website, put your comments below, reach out to me on Twitter, however you want. Submit those questions and have me answer those questions here on Big Data, Big Questions. Thanks again, guys.